Hello and welcome everyone to another Sales Hacker webinar. Uh, this one is coming live from New York right now. I'm uh, over here at the Bowery Capital Sales Summit. Uh, but I'm really, really excited for this webinar for a multitude of different reasons. Uh, one is my, my guest um, is a, a very dear friend of mine and was actually my first VP of sales ever in tech, which is really cool. So I learned an absolute ton from this man listening into my calls, uh, listening into his calls. Um, and what we're going to be talking about is the winning sales demo formula for 2020 and beyond. Uh, Dave, welcome to the community. Thanks, Scott. I really appreciate it. Fantastic to be with you here again. Yeah, I'm excited for this one. And so Dave Kennett is the CEO and founder of a company called Replays. And I'm going to let him kind of talk through his background a little bit and why Dave has such tremendous insight really into what makes a good demo because he's seen literally hundreds and hundreds of hours of demos. Um, so what I want to do before we get too far into it is let's set up some polls. Uh, Dave, I want to see, you know, how, how much time are people getting coached today uh, from an individual perspective? And then I know we had a lot of leaders join us as well. Um, so let's also see how much time leaders are coaching their reps. Dave, what's your, what's your guess on this, my man? I'm super interested to see how this pans out. My guess is that it's going to be super low in terms of sales reps and the number of hours that they're coached per month and sales coaches in terms of um, how much they're able to coach. And you know what? Through no fault of either, right? Like what we yeah. see is sales leaders love coaching. It's that, um, you know, sales directors, sales VPs and organizations in general are always driving to that next quarter. And there's so many other things on the plate. It just drops sometimes. So it's kind of despite their best efforts. But yeah, I think it's going to be lower than either stakeholder would probably want. Yeah. I agree. I'm, I'm very curious to see uh, what the results are. I know, you know, having been in, in BD management, and it's, it's kind of the first thing that gets pushed. You know, you have quarter end and you have all these things in your plate and that one-on-one -on -one meeting comes up and you're just like, I, I just can't, I just can't do this right now. And then it gets pushed. Not that that's the, the correct way to do it, but all right, let's close it out in three, two, one. Okay. Yeah. Super interesting. Wow. Okay. All right. We were kind of right there, Scott. Yeah, Unfortunately, totally. we were right. Yeah. So sales reps, how many hours per month do you get coached by a sales leader? We got 32% saying never, which is crazy. 43%, uh, which is the majority in the one to two hours per month. So it's like, you know, 30 minutes uh, a week. And then 19% at three to four hours per month, six plus only at five. Uh, sales leaders, how many hours per month do you coach your reps? Never is the, the majority is 35%. Crazy that they're willing to admit that. Um, but, uh, and then it cascades down. Once two hours is 30%, three to five hours, 24%. So this is super interesting. And so I'm glad we're, we're having this discussion, uh, Dave, because it's, it's something that needs to be talked about. And we're kind of, it seems like we're letting our reps kind of hang out to dry a little bit. Yeah, you know, super interesting data and what a great way to dive in to, to really start out the webinar, yeah. right? And, I, you know, I agree. And again, hey, we're not going to um, sit here and, 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 and disparage the sales leaders. We've all been there. It's yeah. about how can you create those extra hours in your, in your day and your week to make such a meaningful impact for your, your sales team that deserves it, right? Totally. Or you can just send them the recording of this webinar, which we'll send it out. And there's your coaching done for the, Boom. Love for, it. The for the day uh, or for the week anyway. Okay. So a few quick housekeeping tips. Uh, so number one, as I mentioned, this is recorded. So we're going to share this out with you. Typically takes us about 24 hours. Uh, it'll either come from uh, uh, you know, sales hacker or uh, Dave may send the, the recording out uh, himself. Um, and the last thing is, you know, every time we do these webinars, we got some really great content we're going to cover. We got a deck, a lot of meaty content, but we do do these for you, right? So these are for the community. So we want you guys to get engaged. We want to hear from you. There's a little chat button at the bottom. There's a Q and a section. If you want to jump in there, introduce yourself, what company you're with your title, please do. It always makes it more fun for us when we get some great uh, engagement and ask questions as we go through this. We want to hear from you. We want to hear from 
the questions that you have that is specific to your organization. Dave's been doing this a long time. He sees a bajillion de demos and we'll do our best to, to answer them. Uh, but Dave, why don't you run through this uh, agenda? What we're gonna be covering? You bet. We're gonna start off with what do we typically hear from sales reps and sales leaders in terms of what they want to get out of tips and tricks for a demo. And then we've incorporated that into this discussion. Next, I wanna do a real quick exercise with everyone that's on, on the line. It'll take about two or three minutes. My experience has been very impactful. I, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about what does that winning formula look like for a demo? What are the do's and don'ts when you're demoing? And what are the key takeaways? I love it, I love it. And before we go any further, I uh, would love if you can just provide a little bit more color of your background. I know your background, but for those listening, uh, how did you get to where you're at today, Dave? Yeah, for sure. So in terms of my background, I've been in sales my whole life. Um, absolutely love uh, sales. I love sales coaching, love helping walk customers through the buying journey. Um, and so uh, over the years, I guess it's been about 23 years that I've been in sales. I started off in a tech startup back in 1999 during the dot-com years, a company called Worldbid for like three and a half years. And uh, we had some pretty exciting years, but then uh, a bit of a decline has happened sometimes in startups and specifically in the dot-com bust. And, you know, someone said to me, go big business early with your career, learn on their dime, get really good sales process training. So that's what I did. So for the next decade, uh, I parked myself in uh, two different companies, one, uh, WW Granger. So uh, at the time it was a $6 billion company. It's grown a lot since then. And that's where I got just a ton of really good exposure to different industries, but real good, rigorous sales, uh, formalized sales training and coaching. Made my way up through uh, sales leadership ranks uh, and then moved on to AutoTrader, where I was the director of sales in British Columbia and helped lead through that print to digital transformation. Uh, and again, you know, super really good experience there and, and really good uh, sales training uh, background there. And then got back into my roots, which was the startup world for the last seven years, Scott, and um, as you know, and been working with some really fascinating startups. And typically my role is I'll come in as VP sales and really help either in a turnaround situation or a, a building situation. And, um, and um, you know, when you look at where I am today, so what I found was as a sales leader, I just didn't have as many hours in the day to coach as I wanted to. And when I was VP sales, neither did my directors or frontline sales managers. And so those polls we saw there, Scott, didn't surprise me, unfortunately, um, because I, I lived it, right? And so that's why I uh, started Replays. So I'm the, the founder of a company called Replays. And uh, what we do is we've created something special and brand new in the market. It's called on-demand sales coaching. So gone are the days where you're sitting in a boardroom for, you know, eight hours, five days a week learning sales process. What happens is account executives send us their uh, video recorded sales calls and we review them, edit it down and send it to them so they can consume it outside of key selling hours. And then we upload your, you know, uh, a written sample of two pages of what they can do differently. And then, um, and then we do quick um, live half hour, 45 minute role plays and, and video coaching. So that, that's really where this content that I'm about to share with you came from because we watch hours and hours and hours of demos and often by really, really cool tech companies and, and awesome sales reps. So we wanna share uh, what we've learned. And I have to say, Scott, like looking at the breakdown of the folks on this webinar, like 40% are sales leaders. So what's in it for you is, we're hopefully going to give you some really good tips and tricks at your next huddles, starting with an exercise in two minutes from now. For the SDRs on the call, I love that you're on here. 30% of the people that signed up are SDRs. Like they're chomping at the bit to be AEs and they're doing the right stuff to do it if they're on this webinar. And AEs, we know you want to be the top account executive if you aren't already, top of the leaderboard and closing deals faster and having more meaningful customer and prospect conversations. And that's why we've created this webinar. I love it, man. Let's, uh, let's dive into it. I know you got some good, good stuff. Okay, awesome. So what we typically hear from sales reps is, can you please help us with conducting a better discovery uh, call? So, you know, help us ask better questions, learn how to step outside of the comfort zone. And when you think of, for example, the challenger sale. So um, I never want to have, uh, you know, conduct a webinar without giving some really good, useful tactics people can leave with right away. Most of you have probably read the challenger sale. If you haven't, go out and get it and read it. 
It really talks about having conversations where you respectfully pressure the customer and position yourself as the expert to really um, help advance your, your, um, your position as a sales professional. We'll talk about that in a bit. The next thing is selling the value more effectively is something reps are always asking about. The number one question I get, Scott, is how to shorten the sales cycle. And believe it or not, in your demo, you can actually help do that. And I'm going to show you how. And then selling to multiple levels, right? It's so important to not treat the frontline manager like the C-level. I know that sounds like a no-brainer, but you would be shocked how often that happens. Uh, and then what are the things the sales leaders are interested in? So for you sales leaders on the call, here's what we typically hear. Does this sound familiar? Don't move to, so they're asking the reps, please don't move to solution, solution too quickly. Really take the time to discover the pain. Clearly articulate the differentiators of the organization. And of course, we hear this all the time, don't discount too quickly. So uh, with that, what are the common goals, right? What do we all want? Well, we all want higher win rates. We all want a faster sales cycle and we all want a larger order size or increase uh, ACV. So we're gonna tell you how to do those three things in, in this webinar. So let's get right into it. I wanna really respect everyone's time. When you add up the amount of time out of market that people are taking for this, this webinar, I wanna make sure there's an ROI. So first, quick exercise. Uh, if you've got a pen and paper, write this down. How do you try to make your prospects feel before you jump on to a discovery or a demo call? I just want you to use two words, write down two, please write down two descriptor words. How do you want to make your prospect? Have you even thought about that before, right? And the next is, I'd like you to rank out of 10, whether you've been successful at actually making them feel that way. Are you 10 out of 10? Are you five out of 10? So why am I bringing this up? It's because we are humans selling to humans. And so often we're like uber concerned about, oh, is the second bullet point in line with the first bullet point? Well, okay, yeah, that's kind of important. But what's really important is that you're having um, an overarching tone on your call that makes, you, makes your prospect feel like you're helpful and that you're trustworthy. So those are two words I like to use. Um, there's many more descriptors that I think would be very pertinent here, um, but those are two, two areas I would really make as your overarching goal. So uh, sales leaders in your next huddle, I, I would recommend that you go through this exercise with your team and for 10 or 15 minutes discuss. Next, what are your company's three key differentiators? So Scott, I, uh, as you know, work with a ton of different sales teams and we'll do uh, team coachings as well as individual. And every time when I have them write down the three key differentiators, um, each of them, typically I'll find that there's unfortunately not alignment. There is actually a lot of outliers. So it is so crucial. Uh, so for account executives, know your differentiators, be able to articulate them. Sales leaders, make sure your team is synced on the differentiators. And then I'm going to really challenge the crew that's on, on this call right now. So what now, when you, if you've written down, please write down your three key differentiators next to that. I want you to write down what customer stories or case studies you use to highlight these. And I'll tell you what I usually hear, Scott. I usually hear, well, I've got one or two, but I don't have three. And if there's three differentiators, I don't have enough. And so I can't tell you enough. Honestly, if you forget everything else in this call, I, I want you to remember this. Uh, when you are jumping on that next call, make sure you've got at three to five really good customer stories to highlight your differentiators. Um, and I'm not talking about, you know, the 15 uh, page case studies, like read those case studies, take out the salient points and, and make it like a 30 second sound bite. That's all I'm talking about here. So um, that would be my challenge. And then the next thing, what are the two or three things you really want your prospects to remember? It's important to stay on topic, right? And so write those three things down and keep coming back to them. Picture what they're gonna be talking about after the demo and think what are the two or three themes that I want them to remember? All right, um, let's, uh, so I hope you enjoyed that exercise. Hopefully it's something that's useful and can be used in your next huddle. Now. Scott, the next thing I've got here is the winning formula. I, I keep getting asked, what should, how long should a demo be? How long should a discovery call be? I want to, before I jump to the next slide, I just want to give the footnote that there, there is no one size fits all. If you are in a large enterprise sale organization where it's deep six figures or even seven figures, you're going to have uh, one or two or three very important discovery calls, right? And it could be half hour to an hour, and then you get into solution. 
Um, whereas if it's more transactional, then your formula might look a little bit like this, right? The SDR does their 20 minute qualification call. You get on to the account executive then gets on to an hour long call, never any longer than that. Um, I, I recommend keeping it under an hour. And I recommend, we'll go into each of these steps, but I recommend build rapport, intros and agenda, about five minutes. Um, and when I say build rapport, it's interesting. I just see so often where people dive right into the actual demo. There's no, hey, how's your day going? Or how was your weekend? And we, you know, we all know that there are certain personalities where if you start going down that path, they're like direct driver personalities and they just wanna get right into business. Well, that's fine, then get right into business. But also know there's lots of personalities where they'll be offended if you don't ask them about their weekend and how their day is going. And that's the art of sales, right? Um, I recommend, for example, disc profiling. There's lots of different ways to understand that, but if you wanna really get your team tuned in to picking up on the personality of the person they're selling to, disc profiling is great. So I would spend no more than uh, five minutes on that uh, in terms of intros, and then make sure you do a good robust agenda. We'll talk about that in a sec. Then build on the original discovery. This is where I see 80% of the time, if I'm gonna throw a number out there, that account executives miss. They might spend two or three minutes. They're like, well, the SDR did the, the discovery. Yeah, but now it's time to build on that. And remember, you, you've got a very short period of time to build trust, rapport, credibility, and having a good quality discussion is germane to that. Next, I hate PowerPoint. Uh, I, just, I just do. Um, I think most people do. Um, and it's funny, like, I think most people hate PowerPoint, but when they're putting their PowerPoints together, they forget that others probably hate it too. Don't spend more than five minutes on a PowerPoint is my suggestion, if you can. Go right into demo if you have a demoable solution. You might be saying, hey, I actually don't have a demo of a, I'm not a tech company, I don't have a demo of a solution, then that's fine. Slides are obviously what you're gonna do. I would then be talking about customer stories, et cetera. And then the second biggest miss I see is people don't spend enough time at the end of the call on pricing, decision-making and next steps. Uh, I would literally spend 10 to 15 minutes there. The best sales reps we see that have the shortest sales cycles do that. And I'll share with you in a minute what, what they actually do when they're, uh, when, what they say. Yeah, and just to reiterate the, the point there, because you mentioned something and when we were prepping for this, this webinar and it's, you know, it's not so much that there's a specific like, hey, your demo has to be 30 minutes or it has to be 45 or it has to be an hour. It's more about this time allocation, right? And look at like the percentage of time that you should be spending, you know, building that original discovery, going through next step is much, is that there's more time there than actually the demo itself. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of really hammer, hammer that home is, is that's, you know, the difference between the top one percenters and, you know, everyone else. Yeah, this gives a guideline as to the weighting of how you want to spend your time with the prospect, for sure. Okay, awesome. So what are the do's and don'ts? This is the thing that everyone's always like, okay, hey, what are the best practices and what do I need to stay away from? So let's go into each section. Let's start with before the call. What do you do? Well, pre-call plan. What does that look like? Well, it's important that you're looking up the organization, doing research online, really understanding the, on LinkedIn who you're going to be presenting to, what's their background, what's their title. Think about their persona. What's important to them? Um, and then, of course, make sure you... You talk to the SDR, it's crazy how often I see people running into a demo and they're like quickly huddling with the SDR 30 seconds before they're going on uh, to their uh, demo. And it's just, it, it's just um, not, not a good call, right? So make sure you make that time. Schedule in a 15 minute debrief with the D SDR or even half an hour. Next is reduce distractions. So uh, make sure that you uh, don't have a bunch of background noise going on. Take the time to go on to the computer you're using and turn notifications off. You can see how many demos I see where Slack notifications are coming across the screen. And it's like, hey, what are you guys doing this weekend? Beer later today? And it's like, no, guys. Uh, as we mentioned before, really think about the tone you want to set. How do you want them to feel? Um, think about the two to three key messages. Set your primary and secondary objectives. We're in sales. Every single one of you on this webinar know that uh, sales calls do not go the way we plan them most of the time. So it's important to have your primary objective, but also your backup plan if things are going to take a left turn. Um, and then practice. I, I think this isn't done enough. You know, now that we're reviewing all these videos and people are seeing themselves do a video, they're like, oh, wow, I didn't know I did that before. I didn't know I had 
And, and there's just these little tweaks that can really up your game. So practice with your colleagues, uh, sales leaders, make time uh, for role plays in every single week with your sales reps. Um, I, I just, I can't recommend that enough. And uh, based on the, the quick poll we did, it's, it's not happening today. And hey, I get it, I've been there. Uh, but you know, having your team work together with role plays can be really good. All right. What Dave, is, what quickly, is just yeah. quickly on that one, what's an example? Can you give an example of what a secondary objective would be? Yeah, absolutely. So let's say if your primary objective is I really, so on a very, very transactional sale, you might want to actually get the sale on the call. Most of the time you're not going to, right? Usually the primary objective is, give, you know, really learn more about the organization, build on the discovery you've done, and then uh, ensure that you've communicated effectively the value of their pain points, uh, that, that address their pain points. Uh, but if, you know, you don't get to that, sometimes it's just, okay, uh, if we don't run through everything, I just want to make sure I get a next meeting on the books with them, right? That can be one thing. If it's, all right, we don't make it all the way through um, the, the demo, which hopefully you would, you're at least getting to the discovery question. So it's like when you've got the process in front of you that you're going to follow just kind of high level, they can throw, because they can throw you for any left turn and you can bob and weave. Like the other day I was watching a, a demo and this guy jumped on and he just decided he was going to be not nice to the sales rep. And he actually um, was only on there because his boss had filled out a form saying, uh, Hey, I want my, frontline manager to be on this demo. So this guy did not want to be in the demo. He just wanted to tell his boss he went on the demo. So right away, your primary objective is probably out the window. It's like, okay, now my objective is to win this person over in particular. Like, how do I do that? And, and you know, my coaching to this one rep was just, it's okay to stop and say, listen, uh, this might not be a fit for you. Like, let's just talk about that. Maybe it's not, but if this were to be a fit, what would that look like? And suddenly you're engaging them in a discussion that is interesting to them. And so I would have a couple of questions written down that can get you unstuck from any, any corner. Does that make sense? Makes total sense, total sense. And quickly, you're gonna sneak another question in while I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Michael Klein is just wanting some clarification. He says, uh, should we be role playing every day? Is that what you I, recommend? I honestly think that is the, the goal, yes. And so uh, is it realistic? I don't know. I mean, so if you talk to sales reps that have reported through to me over the years, um, you'll hear that, yeah, they believe in coaching. Did I get around to daily role plays? No, I think daily huddles are important to talk about uh, key learnings and whether you're on track for your target, et cetera. And if you can throw role plays in there, absolutely. Um, but uh, at the very minimum weekly. Yeah. I love it. Do your best. I think like in an ideal world, yeah, we'd be doing it every day. You know, basketball players, sports players, they're, they're practicing their craft every single day. So there's yeah. no reason why, you know, top, top performers shouldn't as well. That's right. All those pros, like the, they, they practice way more than they play, right? All right, cool. The other thing is always control the environment. What do I mean by that? There are a lot of things that are actually within your control. The folks that are on the presentation with you, the prospect, they want you to be successful, right? It's kind of like, when's the last time you went to um, a comedy show and you see someone that's bombing? Like you don't want them to, you want them to be successful, right? And, and it's the same thing in a call. That prospect may challenge you, but they, they don't want to see you fail. And so remember that you're in charge of the environment and you're in charge of the conditions of whether you're going to be successful or not. And even little things like, I, um, you know, I was on a, listening to a call the other day and there's reverberation on the line. And it was on the line for like 30 minutes. And uh, I, I was listening to this recording, right? And I was like, oh man, I wish the account executive would just say something. Finally, the customer said, hey, do you hear that reverberation? And the rep's like, yeah. And the, another person is like, oh, sorry, I just had my speakers on, click. And that's all that had to happen. If the account executive had controlled the environment in the very first 30 seconds and said, hey, I hear some reverberation. Can we just deal with that? then it takes out the distraction. And I think sometimes, you know, reps, especially new reps, so for new reps out there, remember, you're in charge, right? You want the customer to feel engaged and part of the process and you wanna be respectful of what they wanna achieve, but you're in charge of the environment. Um, so that leads to make sure that you've got, um, yeah, so make sure you've got your camera on. I can't tell you that the best winning tech sales teams out there do this every single time. They have their camera on and they prompt their customer to have their camera on. When they do, they've got good lighting, they've got a professional background, they look professional, and 
I, I strongly recommend doing this for two reasons. A, it helps build rapport, right? When you're looking at someone in the eye, you're, you're building rapport and you can actually pick up on nonverbal cues. And so, you know, it's like if you were going to go to someone's office, you wouldn't sit outside their office and talk through the wall, right? So why wouldn't you just turn your video on? So for those of you that do it, I'm sure you agree. For those of you that don't, I challenge you to do that the next time. And a lot of people say, well, no, my customers don't turn theirs on. I would say, you know, two things, two hacks there. One, get the SDR to mention, hey, the next call with the account executive is going to be a video call. Um, you're welcome to turn it on or not. And then the second thing is, when you're actually the seller, you can say, hey, can you see me? And when you do that, it's funny how often it actually prompts people to turn the video on. Yeah, um, I find it almost you, always does. Like when I turn mine on, naturally they will. Yeah. Um, sorry, Dave, you've got some great questions. Thank you everyone for the engagement. Um, so Cameron has a really good question. I would love your take on this. Uh, yeah. If you are a younger rep, would you recommend keeping your camera off? So Cameron's scared that there might be a little bit of you know, ageism uh, going on and he's maybe looks young or is is young. Uh, what are your thoughts there? Uh, my thoughts are Cameron. Thanks for the question. I totally get it. It's a meritocracy out there and by that I mean people will respect what comes out of your mouth not what you look like. So the so, minute you're asking intelligent questions and you're controlling the environment and you're naturally curious about their business and you're adding value and you're setting the tone like we talked about earlier they're not going to care if you're a few years younger, man. Like, don't worry about that stuff. It's in your head. It's not going to be in there. I agree. I, I totally agree. We got one more question. I'm going to sneak in. Ben Klein. Uh, ben says, I find the camera on is a bit distracting for the customer. What are your thoughts here? Sure. It can be distracting. Uh, I do think that there's far more benefit than there is downside, though. So uh, limit the distractions for sure. But the upside outweighs the downside every time it might be. Agreed. And Ben, what I would say is maybe there's a happy medium where you put on your camera for the discovery and for the closing end. And when you're actually demoing your software, if you find that it's too distracting, maybe you just turn it off for that small section. That could be a happy medium. Yeah, great point. Okay, um, I'm just being cognizant of time. I think we've got like 18 minutes left. So I'm gonna start being a little bit more succinct here. Yeah, well, um, we've got, um, we've got like half an hour, but we will have oh, Q and A at the end. Yeah. Oh, I so love we've it. We've got okay, we've got great. the full full hour. Yeah. Oh, then I'm gonna start to talk a little bit slower. That's perfect. Uh, <laughs> well, all right. it looks like we'll have tons of questions, so we can do Q and A at the end. So I love thing. it, man. Okay, great, great. All right, so we talked about building rapport. No need to go over that again. Intros very important. Let's go around the room, get acquainted. Here's a pro tip, you guys. That sounds obnoxious. I don't mean to say this is a tip that I find works time and again. Is Put yourself in the frame of mind that they're in the room with you, right? It, we seem to act differently when there's just someone on the other end of the phone or on the other end of a computer um, camera. And, it, and it's like, the reality is we're, again, two, we're humans that are having human interactions. So make sure that when you're, when you're talking with the folks, you know, and you're doing intros, do intros like you normally would if, if they were actually in the room with you. And keep that in mind as you check in with them throughout the presentation. Uh, next, agenda. So important to uh, drop a roadmap of where you're going and getting the customer's buy-in and seeing what they want to achieve. So three steps for that. Propose the agenda, state the value, check for acceptance. Those three things. And really understand what it is they want to accomplish, right? I, I see a lot of reps making it about them and not about the customer. Um, Always check for the time allotment. Make sure that they're still good for the hour you have booked, for example. Uh, always start off with a level set in terms of the understanding you have from the SDR. So what you don't want to do is make them feel like they have to repeat themselves. So it's important to say and demonstrate that you're valuing their time by saying, hey, I, 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 I really got up to speed from uh, James, our SDR, and and learned all sorts of uh, stuff about your organization. I also researched you online, but I just love to build on that a little bit and learn a bit more. I think it'll make the demo portion a little bit more impactful. Is that okay? Right, so you're getting their permission to dive in deeper, but you're also demonstrating that you didn't just roll into the call with, with no background. Um, you also wanna know why they reached out. Super interesting to hear what comes out of those questions, right? Uh, is it that they were a referral from another customer? Well, that's important. Um, you know, is it that their boss just wanted them to jump on and now it's a box ticking exercise for them? Well, that's important. That's going to change your, 
your approach. And the other thing, and, and I don't see this enough, Scott, is asking, what do you know about our organization? Because um, often, as of course, you're going through the next 45 minutes in your demo and discovery talking about your organization, but this is the point right here where it's so important to do, I call it a 30 to 60 second company overview or level set. And this is where you're talking about the proof points of your organization, right? People wanna know they're not dealing with a, a fly by night organization. They wanna hear about the big brands. They wanna hear how long you've been in business. They wanna hear how many customers you have and that there's customers similar to them. So this is your opportunity to do that. For startups, hey, I've been there where you don't have all the proof points and this is where you need to lean on your strengths, right? And find those two or three key bullet points that are important to establish trust and credibility. Okay, so what do we not do? Uh, I still see all the time people just jumping right into the demo. And I see them, people jump on and they treat it like it's a one-to-many demo, like, hello, thank you for joining to our demo today. And it's like, no, like again, human selling to human. You're not a robot, make it personal. And you know, take the time to interact like you would if they were in, in the room. So again, remember, you wanna picture like they're actually in the room with you. And I also hear this all the time, me, 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 I, I, I. This is what I want to achieve. This is what I want to you know, talk about. This is what I was thinking we could discuss. Make it about them. And then the next thing is I put, don't wear a hoodie. And it's funny how often I see startups saying, well, hey, you know, we're this cool, edgy startup and we want to communicate that. Okay, but you know what? Don't wear a t-shirt or a hoodie. That's my advice. And you might disagree with that and that's fine. People do. Um, but what you want to do is ensure that your message lands with the prospect. And so you don't know going in whether that prospect is a hoodie person or a you know, collar and jacket person. And you know, it's like your parents always said growing up, better to overdress than underdress. Uh, so I'm not saying wear a, wear a suit, okay? I'm just saying, look like, don't look like you just stumbled uh, off, off the streets or out of the gym. Yeah, I'll do a light pushback on that. I wear hoodies quite frequently uh, to demos. I think what I would say on that, and I agree, look professional, but I also think do what is authentic to you as well, right? Like, yeah. you don't want to be, you know, just wearing a suit for the sake of wearing a suit if it doesn't come authentic to you, right? Like, I think professional, yes, but I think, uh, you don't want to be faking something you're not because that's also comes through. In my oh, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, you're like the one dude that could probably pull off the hoodie. All right, <laughs> I give you a hall pass on that one. Um, okay, cool. Next, uh, discovery. So here's what I recommend for discovery. Uh, make sure, like we talked about before, you're adapting your style to the role of the prospect. What everyone is probably thinking on the, on the call, okay, that's easy to say, but how do you do that? And I, you know, in general, that's a whole session we could do on that, right? But I would say uh, for the C-level folks or even director level and above, you're talking value, right? You're not talking in the weeds. The other day I watched this demo and this person was you know, talking to the general manager of one of the largest companies in the world in this space and was asking them metrics, like what, do you, what is your average inventory turnover in X, Y, Z? And those are great questions, but not for the general manager of the whole organization, right? Um, be naturally curious and stay present. Scott, you and I have talked a lot about this in our demolitions, right? And I think, uh, although I believe this through the years, I, I may have ripped this off a little bit from you, which is, you know, that natural curiosity is super important. So when I say stay present, I see often that people are following such um, a script. It's, it's like, I get it. As sales professionals, we've got a lot of moving parts. We've got a lot of planes in the air while we're doing a demo. And it's so important, though, to stay present, right? And to really listen. And why is that important? Often, the customer will drop little nuggets that you don't, like we don't even pick up on as sales reps if we're not listening. It's important to really listen and be like, oh, I'd love to understand what's driving that question. You'd be surprised how many times I see a demo where the, the rep asks a question and, uh, sorry, the, the, the prospect asks a question of the rep and the rep answers it, moves on. It's like, wow, I would like to know what's driving that question because it could probably unlock a whole five minute discussion that we need to know about, right? Maybe about how they're looking at the competition, et cetera. Um, one, this sorry, next one, just to quickly jump yeah. in on that, just a, a tip that helps me stay present when I'm having uh, my meetings and, and demos and things that we're going through is uh, mirroring. Uh, so saying things like, hey, I'm hearing X, Y, Z from, from you. Uh, is, that, is that correct? And kind of reframing what they say back to them. 
and it can help do like a little bit of a check-in and it helps you stay ultra present. Oh man, totally. I love that. And, and it's, it's an absolute must, right? To really make the customer feel heard, but make sure that you've got a shared and complete understanding, right? And so reiterating what they said back to them and saying, I just want to make sure we're on the same page. So, so important. And that actually leads into uncovering the pain. Like I, 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 this is one of the top five things people aren't doing enough of is really um, when you get onto the call, you should have a hypothesis of what you think the pain point is, but you shouldn't be so stuck to that hypothesis that you actually um, assume that you're right. Like let's leave space for you to be wrong and see what the real pain points are. So uh, what I talk about is don't just uncover the pain by saying, you know, things like, you, you want to ask questions like what keeps you up at night with your current solution and you know how does that impact you and and how does that impact other stakeholders in the organization that we talked about you want to ask those kind of things um, and, and really make them feel now you've heard me say this before scott it's cheesy but it's true people will remember it you want to give them the headache and then you want to hand them the tylenol right so we're emotional human beings you want them to feel that emotion when they're talking to you about how pissed off they are about their current solution or how upset it makes them and then talk about also uh, the consequences of status quo. Not every time that we have a call, so for the account executives on the call, you may have done uh, an outbound lead yourself, right? Self-generated lead. It's not, and so that prospect may not have been looking for a current solution when you're talking to them. So you may actually be selling, not against a competitor, but against status quo. And so really what you wanna paint there is dive into the discovery deep on tell me about the pain you're feeling now so that when you end the call and they're, if they are kind of indifferent, you can say, but remember earlier, you were just telling me that your current pain means that it's costing you this much to do this, this much to do this. I've got to believe that a solution like ours would help overcome that. So that's what I mean in terms of really understanding the consequences and the pain of, of sticking with status quo. Um, empathy, super important, right? Make sure that you're not just mirroring what the customer is saying, but saying, hey, I hear you, I understand. And then like use the customer lens, be like, you know, you want to demonstrate that you're coming from a position of understanding the space. And you can do that by saying, we have a lot of prospects we talk to every single week that have the same pain and they've actually become customers of ours. We've helped solve that. Well, what does that do? That tells the, cust the prospect that, uh, hey, uh, you understand their pain, that you have current customers that the pain has been alleviated from the solution you're selling. And then there's a little bit of FOMO, right? So in a bit, we're gonna talk about talking through the customer lens. And that's really what I mean when I talk about that. Have good questions written down. I outlined a couple of them a minute ago. I'm happy to go in more detail another time. Um, and then explore the individual value drivers and KPIs. I mean, when you look at the challenger sale, for example, one of the key traits of a challenger seller is really offering a unique perspective to the customer. So, um, and understanding their value drivers, what's important to them? What are their KPIs? What are they, what are they bonused on, right? Are they reaching out because another vice president in the organization that's an internal customer of theirs is having a pain? Or is it because they have objectives that their comp is tied to and you can help them with that? You need to know that. We need to know that as sellers. Uh, here are the don'ts, don't wing it, right? Don't go in blind um, and uh, assume, uh, don't assume that the SDR caught everything and that's no disrespect to SDRs. The purpose of SDRs is not to catch everything, right? Is to hit the, the four, three or four or five key heuristics you need to know and pass the lead over. So you're building on that. And then think, um, uh, don't think that you're putting the prospect out. So many times I get this from account executives, they say, I don't want the customer to feel like they're on the inquisition stand or that I'm asking 20 questions. And the reality is that it's usually the sales rep that's feeling uncomfortable and they're projecting that on the prospect. Usually the prospect's fine with it. Here's some tips though, um, to help alleviate that a little bit as you're navigating through your discovery. So for the sales reps on the call here, practice this, do this in role play. Be like, you know, uh, if you don't mind just bearing with me, I'd love to learn more about your organization, build on what we learned from the SDR so we can make our time together more more impactful. So you get their permission there. We talked about that a minute ago, but then when you're five minutes into discovery, say, make a joke. It'd be like, Hey, I really hope you don't feel like I'm playing 20 questions here. You're really being great about this, but I have to tell you when we look at following this process, it just really helps us make this more impactful for you. So, so thanks for bearing with me. Nine times out of 10, they're like, Hey, no problem. Right? So you can throw little things in there, transition sentences, 
that assist with making it more natural when you're asking the questions. Okay, slides. If you're gonna do slides, no more than five minutes. Um, this is where you talk about what is the reason for existence of your organization and what are the proof points. Um, articulating uh, the differentiators of your organization, this is your opportunity to do that. When I said you wanna leave them with two or three key messages throughout, they're gonna probably be your differentiators. Mention them often and mention them upfront. Make sure it's a two-way dialogue, right? Like it really should be almost 50-50. Uh, it should not be sounding like I'm sounding right now. I would love to be having dialogue with you, Scott, or with the folks on the webinar. That's not the purpose or function of this webinar by design. But in a, in a real discovery call, it really needs to be two-way. Uh, keep them engaged, right? It's not easy. It's so tough to keep people engaged when they're on the other side of the world, but it's definitely doable. Um, and then reiterate the roadmap for the rest of the call. It's like, we already talked about our agenda, but I'm gonna reiterate where we're going. The customer feels more comfortable when they know how they're gonna spend their time. It's like when you're waiting on hold and they're like, you're the fifth caller and your wait's gonna be an extra five minutes. You just feel a little bit calmer, right? And this is kind of the same idea. What are the don'ts? Don't ever spend more than 10 minutes on PowerPoint unless again, you don't have a tech solution you're demoing, then you have to, but get more into case studies. Um, you know, don't ever forget the PowerPoints usually suck. I, this might just be my thing. I don't think it is. Um, you know, don't use more than five slides and don't make it a speech. Um, here are the do's of the demo. So now we're getting into the meat of the demo. Um, position yourself as the expert when you can. So again, this really is going back to challenger sale. And here's, here's, I just want to, I want to pause here for a second, Scott, and really reiterate a, a key point uh, on what this means. And so when uh, let's say you're selling to a marketing manager well or say a marketing director how many other marketing directors do we think that marketing director talks to through the course of a month or a quarter or a year i don't know maybe two a month maybe they're on a linkedin group a local association maybe a conference once a year so now the actual sales rep though if this is the buyer persona and title they're typically calling into they may talk to like 30 a month 360 a year so do you think that sales rep is going to have a better position of understanding in terms of the pain points and how to address them? Yes. And we forget that. So account executives, my coaching to you is take the time to remember that you actually have more to bring to the table than you think and leverage that when you're talking to your prospect. It's not that we think we can do the marketing director's job better. We can't. That's their job. But we absolutely hear about the pain every single day that they're going through and we know how to solve it. And by the way, we have these amazing customers over here that um, where they've actually addressed the pain points. So that's, that's a key one. Um, when someone asks a, a question or objection, I, always, I often see how uh, the rep will answer it and then they'll just move on. Make sure you pause and be like, hey, I just wanna make sure that we covered your, you know, did we cover that off for you? Did we answer your question? Did, that, did how we answer that make sense? Like it's okay to, really feel comfortable and this is where a uh, difference between a beginner ae and an ae that's been in the role for a year or two they just feel comfortable asking those questions so for all of you new aes push yourself out of your comfort zone share the talking 50 50 and then cover off um this is you know it's important that all of us as humans want to feel that we're making a good choice when we make a buying decision right and we want to de-risk and to help mitigate risk you want to talk about your service levels and what you can deliver the other is, and I can't emphasize this enough, is be passionate. Like, okay, I can't exactly, I know we're doing demos, like, you know, sometimes two, three, four times a day, if you're lucky. And after you've done your hundredth demo, my challenge to you is to make sure the prospect isn't feeling like it's your hundredth demo. And a lot of people do. You know, when you look at why people buy, they buy from people that they trust and they buy from people that really believe in the product. And it's a bonus if they like the person, right? But um, that comes with passion and belief. People feel, again, it's this feeling word again, right, Scott? It's not just bullet points. It's how are you making them feel? Do you really feel that you believe in it? And I'll talk about this in a sec, but like I often see a blind spot here when people are asked about their competitors, uh, you can feel them getting antsy sometimes. And they are like, they clam up. And so account executives and, and sales leaders, my, my coaching to you is, spend time role playing the specific question of how are you different than competitor abc whatever your biggest competitor is and just get it to the point where when you're watching you see them 
answering that with a level of confidence. Um, and then, okay, here's another interesting one. You should never, a lot of account executives think, oh, we'll just check in at the end and see what they think. No, you failed, in my opinion, we failed as sales ex executives, account executives, if by 45 minutes in, we don't have a really good sense as to where everyone's leaning. It means that we haven't done a good enough job being engaging, having the two-way discussion and checking in with them. So by the time you get to the last 15 minutes of pricing and next steps, you should already really know who the advocates are, who the ones are that are gonna give you a tough time and why, and be ready to address those. Um, we talked about customer stories, just so important. Make, make sure you use three to five. Um, pause after each check, section and check in. And, I, and, and it's how you check in is important. I see a lot of times where this is what new account executives often do is uh, I used to do it. It's like they'll finish a section of their demo and say, what are your thoughts on that? Well, that's a good question, but now you want to really dig in and get them in visualizing how they would, how the prospect would use the, the product. Right? So I would say, based on what you've seen, I'd love to get your sense as to how you would deploy this within your organization. And can you see this being used? And once they start talking, bring up different stakeholders. Do you think the sales organization would benefit from it? And, you know, really, really dive in. And, um, you know, when competitors are brought up, the other tip there is be respectful. Everyone knows that, I, I hope, right? Never trash your competitor, um, but be confident and be succinct. Um, usually when someone's feeling nervous about something, they ramble. And that's what I see most of the time when someone's like, tell me about you versus competitor A, they ramble. So practice being succinct. So on the demos, the don't do's, don't talk too much. Don't do, don't rush through it like I'm doing right now. And then train them. Now, here's, here's another sort of thought process uh, I, I, I want to encourage people to think about. I get asked all the time, how do I slim my demo down? Here's the one meter you can use to figure that out. Are you, ask yourself this, are you training them or are you selling and informing? If you're training, you've gone too far. Because I see reps all the time where they talk about the value and they talk about the um, customer story. And then they're like, oh, and look at this functionality. And then when I double click on this, look at what this widget does. And, when, and it's like, they don't care, right? They're on there to learn about your organization, not on how to use it. So the tip here is don't, if you want to slim down your presentation, ask yourself with every sentence you're saying, am I training them or am I informing them? If you're training them, drop it until leave that for the onboarding team. That's what customer success is about, or that's what a follow-up call is for to dive deeper if they want. Okay, end of the call. Um, leave 15 minutes for healthy discussion. Most people don't. If you do this, you will help shorten your sales cycle. Um, think of yourself as, okay, so again, a lot of what I'm talking about is frame of mind. Don't we all as sales reps think when we get off the call, I wonder what they're gonna say when they huddle and, and the prospect's talking about it. I want you to think of yourself as the person leading that post demo huddle. Pretend you're that person for the last 15 minutes, right? Ask them interesting questions in terms of, you know, love to understand whether you're leaning in, leaning out, leaning out. Okay, love to understand more about that. Bob, how do you feel? Jane, why are you feeling? Like, this is you leading that huddle, right? Control the call, control, control the conversation. Um, you know, probe further for all of the key heuristics, you know, whether it's Bant or Medic, um, I don't know if we need to review what those are, right? Budget authority, need timeline. I think everyone knows, right? Metrics, economic buyer, decision criteria, decision process, identify pain, champion. That's what medic is. Um, you know, everyone's got their different uh, thoughts on what the best one is. But either way, don't leave a call without getting through what your company's heuristics are. Um, explore pricing extensively, right? Don't be afraid to dive into pricing. And you want to know where you stand before you end the call. So make sure you summarize next steps get the next meeting on the books, ask how you can support the process and make sure that there's accountability on both sides. This is what I'm going to do. And based on what you said, you're going to be doing this and we're going to meet next time. I'll send a summary of that. Um, and don't ever ask them what the next step should be. I see this a lot, Scott, where they're like, um, so what do you think we should do as a next step? No. Cause if they're like, um, you know what, we're just going to kind of circle the wagons and get back here. It's like, you've just lost control. Now you have to argue with them and be like, no, 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 that's not the way I think we should do it. So what you want to do is propose how you think you should do next step and then ask for their buy-in. Don't only ever just leave two minutes for it. I see it all the time. Don't ever leave the call with a ton of question marks and don't ever open the door for negotiation on pricing before they ask. I see this too often. They talk about pricing. The person doesn't even push back and they're like, and just so you know, we're not going to lose on price though. I just want you to know that. Like I shouldn't be telling you that, but, and like, 
account executives, don't do that. You don't need to. All right, so whew, we almost made it to the end. Key takeaways, position yourself as the expert, talk through the customer lens, three to five customer stories. If you just do that alone, you're gonna up your game. Um, and by the way, if, if when you did that exercise, you wrote down three stories that align to three differentiators, but it's the same story you've been telling for a year and a half, you're only getting half points. You gotta come up with new stories. Uh, really explore the pain and the cost of status quo and act as though the prospect is in the room. I love it, man. I love it. That gives us 10 minutes for some Q&A and we have some excellent questions. So uh, definitely have an uh, engaged audience. And uh, I know I was taking, taking notes as always, Dave. Uh, you got uh, a ton of good, good stuff in there. Um, okay, let's take this one. Uh, this is just a kind of a software question. What software do most people use for demos? Uh, we are using Microsoft Teams. Um, I know, you know, we just typically use like Zoom, like, like we're, we're doing this. Uh, Dave, any, any software that uh, you would recommend as far as demos go? Yeah, I try and stay sort of tech agnostic, but I'm not going to on this one. Zoom, <laughs> I love Zoom. I use it religiously. Use Zoom would be my two yeah. cents. Yeah, it's a good one. Um, okay. What argument can you give to a prospect that tells, tells you uh, that they're out of budget until the end of the year and then tells you to contact him again in six months? What would be, I would, I would you don't want to start an argument with your prospect, but how would you respond to that, Dave, when basically someone says, hey, I got no budget this year. Let's bring this up again in six months. What's typically your response to something like that? I think the first thing you want to do is establish whether um, that's actually fact or not, right? So they're either blowing you off or it's true. And you want to respect the customer. And, and, and so make sure you're not calling BS on them at all, because often it's true, right? That's totally true. Someone tried to sell me something. I, didn't. I, I don't have budget for it. So you want, I just don't. Right. And, yeah. and if they challenge me on that in a disrespectful way, I'd be like, Hey, see you later. You, it's how you made me feel. So remember how you're making them feel, you know, respected, trusted, etc. cetera. Uh, but I think it's important to say, okay, I respect that. And, you know, one thing that would probably be useful is we can start sending you some tidbits on our organization of how we can help you between now and then. So can I just spend a couple minutes asking you just a few more questions about what's important to you? So that way it'll really tailor the content. And actually it'll give you and your team a, a better preview of our solution when you actually go to buy it. So I would ask for permission to ask more questions and keep the conversation alive and get them, ask for permission to keep in touch with them once a month in, in the form of a personalized drip campaign, not a phone call, but a, you know, a drip campaign. Totally. I would agree. And yeah, just be wary of taking that first objection you get at face value, like you said, right? Yeah. Like often it's just a throwaway objection. Um, you got to get to the real uh, meat and potatoes, so to speak of, of what they're actually uh, pushing this off for. And if it actually makes sense for you, to, you know, spend the next little while, you know, keeping in touch with them because it might just be a bad fit. So totally agree. Um, Luke Binder has a good question here. Uh, what do you think of having an SDR on the demo as well? I found this to be very helpful and a great way to help them grow in their role. Uh, Luke, I'm personally a, a fan of it. There's arguments for both. Um, you know, you, you're taking them off the phone that I think the, the learning that they get from that uh, outweighs uh, the, the loss kind of time cost. Dave, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, if I look at the both stakeholders, I look at the organ, like I look at the company that the SDR works for. Um, it's very useful in terms of providing um, a real good window into how account executives are pitching and gets them in that environment. These days, though, we can do that via uh, recordings, right? And so that's less germane, I think. Um, I, I also think time is our best friend and our worst enemy in sales. And so there is a real opportunity cost to that SDR's time. So I would say do it, but not do it every time um, mm -hmm. so that they're starting to get comfortable in that environment. But if they could be driving one or two more leads as a sales leader, I'd prefer they do that. And they can watch the actual webinar later. From a customer perspective, I think it demonstrates continuity. So I think that's good, right? So I don't think there's a huge drawback there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on the same page. Uh, Michael Klein has a, a question here saying, do you ever start a demo saying, Mr. Prospect, with your permission, I'd like to end this call with either a lean in or lean out. Out of respect, I wouldn't want to be left in the dark. I don't think there's anything wrong with, with asking that. It's almost like a, a trial close, if you will. Dave, thoughts there? 
I think it's an interesting tactic. I think the idea behind it's good. I think I would position it slightly differently if I was going to do that and say something like, really, my objective here is to provide a valuable use of your time. So at the end, you and I can have a conversation on whether you're kind of leaning in or leaning out. That's how I'd probably position it. So it's more about them, not you. And it's less robotic. Yeah. But I, but yeah. I like the idea and I like the question. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, we've got, we've got it done. This is probably one of the, probably some of the most questions we've had in a very long time, okay. which is good. Um, how do you get the conversation back on, this is from Jennifer. Jennifer, thank you for the question. How do you get the conversation back on track if someone is picking up on nitpick, uh, nitpicking details? This is a really good question because this happens. Sometimes prospects get fixated on like one little thing and they keep going back to it. What is your... Uh, how do you coach against that typically, Dave? Oh, I smell a role play. Okay, Scott, here we go. Let's do it, man. Throw me in. <laughs> You're the nitpicky customer. Okay, go. Okay, okay. Dave, I, I, can we just go back to that, uh, that last page there? there? There's this thing that, you know, if we have that, it's going to screw up my whole workflow. Oh, wow. Is that right? Okay, let's explore that a little bit. So then I would, uh, so here's what I would do. I would explore that. But I think there are questions really, if you've asked like your eighth question like that. So let's pretend that's your eighth question like that, right? Yeah, and yeah, like, exactly. Then I would say, yeah. you know what, uh, Scott, great question. Um, when we set out sort of our roadmap for this discussion, we only have an hour and we've got some pretty lofty things we need to cover. Uh, what I'd love to do is uh, just to keep things on track is let's continue down this path. But I do not want you to, this question to go unanswered for you. So can, can you and I have a sidebar afterwards? where we really explore this, because I can tell it's important to you. I would just do that. I love it, I love it. That way you're not completely just like thrown off track. You can still hit all the points and it almost gets you, you know, a guaranteed next step because you're gonna explore that as a next step. I like it. Yeah, yeah. Um, what if the prospect asks about price? They almost always do as it's top of mind. Let's say like right at the get, this is what I'm hearing. It's like, Darren wants to know if they ask about price, like right at the get go, how you handle that. It's such a common question. Here's how I handle it. Um, I, cause everyone knows, as you said, Scott, this does happen most of the time. So yeah. I would say absolutely happy to talk about price. I mean, we have a portion at the end of our discussion actually just allotted to price, but I'll give you a preview. I mean, I'm going to tell you really, hopefully it'd be helpful if I tell you two things structurally, how we structure it. So going to that, this is how we structure it. Here are the tiers and range. You know, I really need to ask a few more questions to give you a specific quote, which is part of the reason we need to do the, 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 the discovery piece here, or the, the question I'm going to ask you, but I'll give you a range. Like for a small organization, it's kind of here to here, mid here to here, large here to here. I'd put you in medium. And you know what? That usually answers the question, right? What I wouldn't do, what, what the, the do not do is just ignore it and say, we'll get to it later. Satisfy their curiosity, but leave the door open. I love it. I love it. All right. Well, we have tons more questions, uh, but what I'm going to ask uh, people to do is just go ahead and connect with Dave on LinkedIn. Dave's happy to, you know, give you some, some points and, and tips. So if we didn't get to your question, reach out, connect with, with Dave. And uh, Dave, thank you so much, man. You're so, you're, you have so much knowledge. And if you are an individual contributor out there who wants to, you know, supplement some of the coaching that you're getting, Definitely, definitely take a look at replays. And if you're a leader that wants to set up your team with more coaching and, and training opportunities from truly some of the industry's you know, best coaches out there on the on-demand fashion, which I think is the coolest part, it's like when they actually need the help, uh, go check out replays as well. Um, and Dave, thank you, brother. Always a pleasure, Scott. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. Have a good one. We'll talk to you soon. A lot of fun. Thanks, everyone, for joining us.